jump forward, uh, quite a bit forward, but not too far forward, but the, the last book of Revelation, and this is going to be the context in which we're going to be focusing on today, and then we'll, we'll pick up some of the things that we talked about last week so that we understand where we're going, but in one verse here in Revelation chapter 21 and verse 4, it tells us here, speaking of the hope of the future, and it tells us and reminds us in verse 4, that God himself will be with them, be their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain. For the old order of things has passed away. Now, so I want to ask, and I've entitled today's sermon, Painless. And I, I, I've got to imagine what our lives would be like, and I would like for you to imagine what your life would be like if you had no pain, none whatsoever. That is, and we talked about last week, that there is physical pain, there's psychological pain, there is emotional pain, there's spiritual pain that we have. There are agonies that we all have suffered through. We, we recognize, and hopefully we came to a greater appreciation, that in the pain and the process that, God has designed us in such a way that when things go wrong, we experience pain. One way or another, we experience pain. Also, God helps us to see that even when we do things right, that sometimes and oftentimes there is pain. Because we live in a broken world, and the, the examples that I gave last week was the Virgin Mary, a young girl whom God, through the archangel, came and said, Mary, you are favored in God's sight. And you are going to have a son. He's going to be the Messiah. His name is going to be Jesus. He's going to be the Savior of the world. And you would think with that kind of announcement, such good news and all that, there would be no pain whatsoever. But that is not the case. Mary suffered all kinds of pain as a result of that. Accusations that were made against her, accusations that are made against her son, uh, the problems that she had just living, knowing that he was, if, if he is the Messiah, and seeing the miracles that he did and believing in him, knowing and hearing from Jesus himself that he was going to die. And that's, that is a painful knowledge that she had to live with. We also, I tried to also give you the example of Jesus and Peter. When Jesus was telling Peter that he was going to have to go to Jerusalem and that he would be killed, Peter's response to that, there is no way that I am going to allow this to happen to you. you I, we're not going to allow this to happen. And Jesus said, response to that then is this, get you behind me Satan because you do not savor the things of God so we've talked about God's plan and God's purpose and oftentimes people tend to believe that pain is plan B as far as God is concerned but there's a little bit of a problem with that in as much as we read in scripture in the book of Peter for example that before the foundation of the world, Jesus was slain. It was a, a predetermined event because God knew mankind and he has a purpose for what he is doing. And Jesus being slain is not without pain. And we see how Jesus handled that pain and the agony uh, that Jesus went through in this life. And then he tells his disciples that if we are to be his disciples, we have to bear our cross, which is indicative of pain being in the process. And all of us experience pain. 
all kinds of pain, and if I were to ask you at this very moment what kind of pains that you have, uh, we, we could, I'm sure, come up with a laundry list of pain. Pain from losses, pains that are ours, and pains that are others that we have inherited that fall upon our hearts and shoulders, the agonies that we see around us. So to think about a life that is painless, it's very difficult for us to think about that. Because, by the way, all of us have one, that incredible pain yet ahead of us. And I'm not trying to be morbid, but it's called the pain of death. If not for us, which it will be, but let's say those others that we love who may die before us. And then we have children or ourselves who are in physical pain and, and difficulties. So one has to believe that God has a purpose for the pains. So I, the part of this question that I want to, for us to think about is what would our world be like if there were no pain? If we suddenly woke up and found ourselves without pain, how would we know it, and how would we respond? It's like you went to bed, you were in this incredible pain, and, and somehow, when you woke up, it was all gone. How would, what would be different about your life? Thinking, wait a minute. Wait a minute here. I'm not hurting. Wait a minute here. My heart's not hurting. My emotions are not hurting. I feel safe. I feel secure. And, wow, whatever I do, there's, there's no pain. Of course, as people get older, so many people are inflicted with, like, arthritic pain, and every movement is a pain in their life. So, if we ask ourselves this question, has there ever been a moment, a, a brief moment, or whatever in your life, when you have been without pain, totally absent of pain? Well, what about right now? Are you totally absent of pain, or can you feel some aches and pains? Or can you imagine some aches and some pains, and I don't want to bring up. I know enough about myself, and I know enough about you to suggest that I could bring up a couple of things that would be painful. So, if we were without change, uh, without pain, what would change about us? Would anything change if we were without pain? And what would we do that we're not doing now? Is there anything that we'd be doing that we're not doing now if we didn't have pain? And what would we think about in terms of our present pain that affects, afflicts us? As I've mentioned, the physical, the mental, the emotional, and you cannot do without the spiritual. Karen paid that song about our soul. And, the, you know, the, the popular one for all of us, and it is well with my soul. But you think about deep down inside of you, all of us have this pain of that something in life is not quite fully there and missing. So how does other people's pain, though, impact us? I know, you know, as we've talked about, we've prayed for other individuals and the pain that they're going through. And as you deal with that, and you think, well, I'm, I'm not concerned about other people's pain. Maybe I could just isolate myself. Do you know how much pain there is in isolation? People, criminals, they will put them in solitary confinement, isolation. Can you imagine what it's like to just be in your head? So if you're going to be in total isolation, let's take away sight, sound, hope, take all those things away. Life itself, total isolation. How painful would that be? 
I'm reminded of what Jesus said, those that were cast into outer darkness. You think, whoa, that's, that would be extremely painful. So, how much of our pain motivates us? How much effort do we put into our lives or is motivated by pain for both good and bad? Or how much of our life is motivated by the avoidance of pain? And we have to recognize in terms of life that we do things to avoid pain is we have to ask ourselves, is that the best motivator? And how much does that motivate us? I ask that question because there is another, if we want to call it, theological question behind that. And the theological question that I actually want to deal with today is this one. If we had no pain, how would we relate to God? And is pain a key motivator? For example, fear is painful. Uh, It's painful in the sense we can use all kinds of words for fear, but it's like anxiety, paranoia, not knowing, can't trust your mind, can't trust your thoughts, can't trust other people around you. So we'd ask ourselves that. I'm going to make kind of a broad sweeping statement, and let's kind of look at it. One of the reasons and one of the great things that we learn in our pain, in our life, is to do the things which God has called us to do them, but not out of pain, but out of something else, out of the love of God. This brings into play what Jesus said in his outline prayer. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So the question for us, is the will of God in our life painful? And will the will of God in our life in eternity be painful? Now the answer is, answer is kind of twofold. In a way, I'm going to suggest the will of God in this world is painful. Because we live in a broken world. But imagine for a while how Jesus said, I always do the things that pleases my Father. My Father loves me. I love Him. There, there is this in, that we, we are one with one another. Is that painful? No, it's not. So I'm suggesting that the huge lesson that we learn in this life is that we come to do things God's way, not out of pain, but out of a love for God, out of faith and out of hope. And it changes. So when we think about, and let's think about, about, for example, our human earthly relationships. People who have a wonderful marriage have a wonderful marriage not because they are obligated or motivated to do things out of fear. They do things out of love. Now, it can be painful in this world because out of love, we may be tending to someone who is in a great deal of pain. I know a lot of people who are caretakers for other individuals. And brethren, that is painful. If you're there with a person who is dying, in the process of dying, it can be pain and can be and is painful both ways. To lose a loved one is incredibly painful. But the motivation that we're talking about is, is out of a motivation of love. We live in a world, and athletically wise, 
anybody who's ever been involved in this, and Richard, when he was playing soccer, could say this as well. No pain, no gain. Well, how does that play out with Revelation chapter 21? There's no more pain, no sorrow. So when we look at the context of no pain in Revelation chapter 21, we see, first of all, it, it begins there in verse 1 of Revelation chapter 21, and this is what the Apostle John, in, in his revelation, is seeing a new heaven and a new earth. So when we think about doing the will of our Heavenly Father, we, we see it in the context of a new heaven and a new earth. Now we also, and I mentioned this last week, and we'll go back to this briefly here in Romans chapter 8, because the Apostle Paul is talking about our relationship that we have with the Father through the Holy Spirit, but he also then is talking to us about the problems that the creation has. He says for the, this beginning here in verse 20 of Romans 8, is for the creation is subjected to frustration not by its own choice. So it's like this is the way it's made. So we think, for example, let's take a look at our world. We have in our world, the earth that we have, we have crust on the outside, mantles, we have volcanic activity, we have eruptions, we have earthquakes, we have floods, we have droughts. We have problems. And it has been that way. We've had ice ages. We've had things happen. We've had cataclysmic events. We've had some small meteors hit our planet and create incredible chaos. I mean, we're, we're not pockmarked like the moon is pockmarked, but hey, that's a pretty close call some of those craters you see in the moon where they've been slammed, but this earth is in pain. We have polluted the earth. God is so merciful. You know, we keep polluting the water. What does God do? It's in, to me, it's incredible. It's called, as I understand it, it's called adiabatic expansion. It rises into the atmosphere. God distills the water and sends it back to us fresh and clean. We keep doing it. I mean, you you go to some of these places that that quote aren't polluted like we're polluted. You go to say some island out in the Pacific, and you look at how beautiful and clear the water is. So you go as we backpack, Monty and and I and my son when we first got here twenty years ago, back in the Sierras where there was nobody, just mountain lakes, and the water is just beautiful. When we were in New Zealand, and the water coming down out of the glacier, it was something. It was interesting because the guide said, look, just dip your bottle in the stream. It's that good. It is not polluted. You don't have to worry about anything. You don't have to worry about bugs, leeches, or anything. It is just pure, good water. God has made, he's so kind to us. In, in, in the creation, we have not taken very good care of it. So we see, though, that God is promising us, promising us there in Revelation a new heaven and a new earth. And then Paul says that this creation, is it's not by its choice, but by the will of the one who has subjected it to that, but it has subjected it into hope. And I believe the same thing is true of us. Even in our pain, there is a hope that God has and a reason and a purpose that changes us. That's why when we read today earlier about the comfort wherewith we have been comforted, we comfort others. See, our comfort isn't just for ourselves. It's about to express the faith and the hope and the love of God to others. That's what evangelism is about is expressing the love of God. Not just God's going to execute you, but it is the love and the grace of God that has been extended to us. It goes on to say that the creation itself will be liberated from bondage to, to decay and brought into the glorious freedom of the children of God. 
When we think about paying less, that is a glorious freedom. Again, think about all the pains. And, and we have different ones that I haven't even mentioned about financial pain, worries, all these things that we have. But into a glorious liberty of the children of God. We have learned in our pain how to be helpful to others and be concerned about them in our own realities as well. For we know that the whole creation has been groaning as pains of childbirth right up until the present time. In this very moment, this world is still groaning. And we ourselves find ourselves groaning. And we find that, wow, suddenly I got older. I haven't got to the point yet to admit that I am old, but I am older. Of course, that's the pain of denial and the like in the process. So we see, though, as we go back to the Revelation, that we it's a, it's a new holy city, a new Jerusalem from God, and that God is the source and the creator. And here's the beauty of that, even as in describing this new heavens, new earth, a new holy city, Jerusalem. So imagine for a moment from Washington, D.C. to New York to Chicago, all this urban areas, all the cities and all that were just wiped away. And here's this new city. A new Jerusalem, as it were, put in its place. And the way John describes that city, I mean, streets of gold, great pearl gates. There is no need for light. God dwells there. No sinner is there. And you think, whoa, I can go out at night. And by the way, it's not night. Uh Oh, I'm a young, beautiful woman. And I can walk the streets and I do not have a single fear that I'm going to be attacked, violated. I don't. I can just. I don't. I don't have any startle responses. I. Don't, I feel vibrant. I feel alive. And I feel safe. I feel secure. I feel love. I feel hope. I feel all of these things. I have no pain. Can you imagine? if we just did away with all those things. Now, our government promises, well, we'll we'll make some changes and the like, and nobody will be left behind. But we think about what God is is offering to us there. So when he talks about that the new Jerusalem is like a bride adorned for a husband, this is about a loving relationship. And all of us, all of us like to be loved And all of us, I believe, like to love. But it's coming to understand God's love and sharing God's love with one another. So it goes on in Revelation chapter 21 and verse 3. It says that God shall, he shall tabernacle of God is with men and he will dwell with them. This, obviously, this precious lack is a cause for pain for all of us. That is, if God does not dwell with us, our soul simply is empty. Because if if there is no God, if there is no God, many of us are 25 years from blackness. Total demise. No more memory. No more nothing. It's it. It's over. It's done. Oh, we'll die. And that isn't a welcome scenario in and of itself if there is no God. Because those last few days are going to be faithless and hopeless and loveless. That's, That's If there is no God. But if there is a God... That's not the kind of pain that we have to go through. So we see here that God will be with them. God in our lives. 
helps us to deal with the pain that we have in the process in this day. And so we're created to be in relationship with God. We're created to be His people. And again, it says God shall tabernacle shall be with them. The lack of belonging is painful. Don't belong to anything. Have no belongings and don't belong. I don't know if you've ever felt like that. We have words for that like um, rejection. But we're not just talking rejection. We're talking total rejection. But not just rejection. Rejection from what you would like to love. That's a painful place to be. But he says God will be with them. He'll be their God the one true God, and that Jesus said of that God, He is our Heavenly Father. Love is the best, and God is love. So let's read quickly some of the things that we can know about God. Helps us to understand and helps reduce the pain that even in the process, as we move towards eventually a life that will be painless. Now, it is in the context here of Revelation, he says there's no more pain, there's no more sorrow, there's no more death, none of those things. So, but we'll, we'll look here in 1 John chapter 4 now, beginning in verse 9, and here's what John writes. This is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only son into the world that, he might live th- that we might live through him. This love. Not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son for an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Now, this is one of the pains that, gets, that God gets rid of. He gets rid of our sins. We have forgiveness in Christ Jesus. Dear friends, since God so loved us, we ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God, but If we love one another, God lives in us, and his love is made complete in us. It's a process of being made complete if we love one another. We know that we live in him, and he in us, because he has given us his spirit. These are things that help us and to give us reassurance so that we don't live in a world of fear all the time in this life or the life to come. So his spirit dwells in us, and we know that his spirit helps us. We read there in Romans, not today, but oftentimes about how the spirit of God unites with our spirit, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. And we have seen and testified that the Father has sent his Son to be the Savior of the world. If anyone acknowledges that Jesus is the Son of God, God lives in them, and he in God. And so we know, and we rely on the love God has for us. This is our confidence, our reliance. It tells us then, God is love. Whoever lives in love lives in God, and God in him. In this way, love is made complete among us so that we will have confidence on the day of judgment. See, there's not a fear about the day of judgment because we know the love of God. We have the spirit of God because in this world, we are like him. There comes the pain, because we live in a world that doesn't like to be like Jesus. And it creates pain. You get called names. And that's what Jesus, and I was talking about the pain in the process, even in the Sermon on the Mount. You know, you'll be persecuted for my name's sake. And then notice this, there is no fear in love. But perfect love drives out fear because fear has, no, has to do with punishment. And the one who fears is not made perfect in love. So when you think about the kingdom of God, we think about revelation, there is no fear. In fact, it goes on in that same chapter a little bit later on. It talks about the fearful and unbelieving have no part in the kingdom of God. God isn't about making us be fearful. So we find the Holy Spirit dwells in us. 
we also find the empowerment of the love of God, even in a painful process where Jesus, it's mentioned of Jesus in Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 2, that for the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross. And we also have encouragement what we recognize in this life, and this is what Paul told the church in, in Corinth, and, and when he was writing about the resurrection, he said, look, if in this life only you have hope in Christ, you are all people most miserable. But we have hope in the future, and we also have hope in the present. And so, we find here in Revelation chapter 21, verse 4, the scripture that we're looking at, God's personal involvement in removing our tears. Now, this is helpful for us, again, when we think about being painless. It is God's involvement, and God just, the way, the way John says, says that God himself wipes away our tears. Not only does that, he removes our sufferings, our hurts, our disappointment, and our losses. Because we all have suffered losses, painful losses. Then he goes on to say, there's no more death. The last enemy, according to the book of Corinthians, the Apostle Paul's writing there, the last enemy to be destroyed is death. So there's no more death. We find, again, and this is important to recognize it in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, and it, I have it in your notes from verse 45 to 58, about the change from the natural to the spiritual, from the Mortal to the immortal, from the corrupted to the incorruptible, from the earthly to the heavenly, to the, to the spiritual. And there is neither sorrow or crying, because we've all been in sorrow, and that's a very painful place to be. Now, here's the encouragement. If you think about, okay, about living in the will of God, and this is what we're we're challenged to do in this life is to say, Lord, my life, even in the pain that I have, I love doing your will. I love the hope that you give to me because I know it's good and I know I can trust in it. I love your faithfulness and I love being faithful. And Lord, I do love the way you love me. And how that you, God in, in spirit, living in us, Christ living his life in us, helps us to love one another. So when we think about the future, when we think about God saying there, there is no pain, we're motivated by the love of God. And we have an opportunity in this life to learn and to practice that and say, well, why do I do the things that I do and why do I think the things I do? It's because God loves me and I love him. Why do I love my spouse the way I do? Because God loves her or him and I love them. And I appreciate that. It isn't out of, out of fear it isn't, it, and it isn't painful. It isn't painful to do good. It is in this world because our world is broken. It can be and oftentimes is because people just don't cooperate. But here is the beauty that it kind of sums it up in verse 5 of Revelation chapter 21. Jesus says, you know, he's the beginning, he's the end. And he says, I make all things new. I am faithful. I will do it all things new. So those things which have pained us in the past, all the losses what we may have, and, and that's, that's what he said there in, in the book of Romans, our suffering is not to be compared to the future that we have. Yes, brethren, I'll admit that life is painful. I'll admit, and, and I agree, that God designed us with the capacity to feel pain. We have a spinal column. We have a brain. We do things. We cut ourselves. We hurt. We do all of those things. 
I believe that God had a purpose and does have a purpose in the pain. We can reduce that pain by making choices that are God-like, but that doesn't mean we're going to be free of pain in this life. But the future holds out for us an opportunity to live life pain-free. So when Jesus said, I am the good shepherd, I can't come that you might have life and you have might have it more abundantly, we haven't seen anything yet. But we have a future. And in that future is no more pain, no more sorrow, no more death. But it is a relationship with God, pain-free. Wow, it's awesome. Let's give God thanks and praise and prayer and conclude. Father, we thank you very much. We thank you for the hope that we have for the future. We thank you for being there in our pain and your forgiveness, your redemption, your reconciliation. We thank you that Jesus knows our pain and he is is so gracious to us all. We thank you for your mercy, your compassion, for who you are, for your love. And we ask, Father in heaven, for your help with the pains that we still do have in this broken world. We ask for our loved ones who are in pain that you'll help them. Thank you that you care for them and you love them. For ourselves, Father, whatever those pains may be, we just pray for your removal of them, that it be done to your glory and your praise and honor. We thank you for it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Feeling the blues today or tired of life already? Do you have questions about life? or need spiritual advice. The Worldwide Church of God is located in Fairfield, Santa Rosa, and Modesto, California. We welcome everyone to attend our worship services with us every week at the times listed on your screen.